Our second question comes from Tom. He knows you dealt with the Hebrew roots movement a bit, and he would like your take on the Sabbath at some point, and specifically how are Christians supposed to observe it? Yeah, th- this actually, again, I, th- I think it's pretty easy to, to tell that this question sort of gets into also the issue of is Sunday the Sabbath, you know, what the whole Lord's Day question. I think it's safe to assume, uh, both from the New Testament and also the you know, early church history, that you did have uh, Christians keeping Sabbath uh, throughout the early church period, the apostolic period, and of course, you know, beyond that. Uh, Jesus kept the Sabbath, so that wouldn't be anything unusual. You know, Easter in the early church was observed on an annual basis in connection with Passover. So there you have, again, another uh, Israelite Jewish holy day. So this sort of mixture uh, is not a surprise in any regard. Uh, you know, we have Paul talking to the Corinthians about laying up, you know, money on the first day of the week. Uh, the traditional approach, again, to that passage sort of assumes uh, that why would Paul mention the first day of the week unless there was some sort of formal gathering, a special occasion. But again, Paul never actually comes out and, and says that there's no command uh, to meet on the first day of the week. It's just something in the New Testament that you, that you more or less observe. You know, we we read it and we see that, oh, the first day of the week, that's the day the Lord rose, people were getting together. But there's no actual command that replaces the Sabbath with this day or, you know, does anything vice versa. It really, uh, you, you don't get anything that formal. So just in a general sense, the evidence uh, for or against a, both really, a weekly remembering of the resurrection in the apostolic age or saying that this is the new Sabbath, so we must meet, we must do a particular thing on this day. The evidence for a a sanctioned, official, mandatory meeting, whether it was thought of as the Sabbath or as the Lord's Day, is very ambiguous uh, with respect to Scripture. Again, you, you you read it happening, but again, there's no formal command. Now, that plays into this whole question about re- observing the Sabbath, you know, what, what should Christians do? Uh, there's no requirement of Sabbath, just like there was no requirement of a Sunday Lord's Day meeting. Both of them happened. Uh, you, you look at a passage like Acts 2, uh, verse 46, again, we, we, we passed over this, but if you, if you go to Acts 2, 46, it's again something that's easily missed. It says, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. The Christians received their food with glad, you know. So they were actually doing both. Early believers were, were doing things at the temple, and they were meeting house to house. And then, again, in certain contexts, we see the meeting on the Lord's Day as well. But there's no formalization of any of it. And so to argue, uh, you know, any one of these positions that we must observe Sabbath as Christians, well, why? There's no command. Or we must look at Sunday as the new Sabbath. Why? There's no command to do that, you know, to meet. If if that exchange had taken place, it would be logical that we'd see a direct command uh, about that day and, and no others, and, and certainly cutting the temple off as well. Uh, but again, it, it, it's just sort of this thing that, that that's reported on, but nothing sort of laid down. Now, in, in three passages, Paul does say some pretty specific things that sort of relegate the Sabbath to the time or the era or the context of the law and the law of Moses and sort of moves it from the law of Moses to, in Greek, the adiaphora. The, the, those are matters of indifference, uh, disputable matters, you know, things that, that you could do. You could pick one, one or the other, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another, uh, like in Romans 14 when Paul talks about doubtful disputations, which re- refers back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Specifically, in that chapter, it was about the meat sacrificed to idols. But these are the, these are things that you could you could go either way on, and you need to again treat each other well, regardless of what decision you make. So, these three passages where Paul sort of takes this thing that was you know an, an intrinsic to the law and the and the the era of the law, uh, the, the really the focus on on ethnic national Israel as the people of God, but now we're dealing with the circumcision neutral thing we call the church. And so it's not the same, you know, level of, of importance, or at least in terms of the, you know, the, the calendar, the ritual events, if we could use that phrase uh, in the life of the early church. The three passages are Galatians 4, uh, 8 through 11, 
Again, in the context of that passage, uh, Paul, I think, is pretty clear that Sabbath observance is not to be imposed on uh, a believer uh, in the name of, you know, law keeping as though uh, it, it merits any any status before God. Uh, or, and it's also not to be sort of observed uh, sort of as a prospective promise of, of any, you know, reward eventually, or again, any, any further standing in the gospel or in our relationship with the Lord. I mean, it, it's relegated again to, to something that, you know, it, it, you can do it or not do it. Again, he doesn't say don't do it either, but he doesn't command that, that the Sabbath be observed. Uh, Romans 14, 5 and 6. Here we are. I just mentioned Romans 14 a few, maybe a minute ago. Uh, Paul, again, comments very briefly on the Sabbath issue, but he makes it evidence that, you know, observing specific days and the Sabbath and the Lord's Day, again, we're throwing the Sunday in, in with this. Again, these are matters of conscience. They're not, again, legal or moral or spiritual or theological obligations. Again, Romans 14 is all about that sort of stuff, and we find the Sabbath mentioned in, in there. A uh, third passage would be Colossians 2.16. Again, Paul, I think, is pretty clear that it's not a condition of spirituality, Again, it's not inappropriate. I mean, you can you can do it or, or not do it. Observe some different day. And again, this applies equally to Sabbath and the elevation, you know, of, of Sunday. So I think it, it sort of cuts both ways. Now, you, all all that sort of boils down to this: that it's really difficult to find any specific exegetical evidence that any of this was commanded in the New Testament. And I think there's a reason for that. And I think the reason is actually the fourth chapter of Hebrews. If you look at Hebrews 4, 8 to 13, here's what it says. Writer of Hebrews says, For if Joshua had given them rest, again, them being the the people of God in the Old Testament, the Israelites, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on, a day of rest. So then there remains, now catch the phrasing here, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Now that is, that's a linking of the Sabbath idea with salvation by grace through faith, which we know was offered to everyone, not just Israelites. So again, it, 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 I'm, I'm going to say it again, it links Sabbath language to this circumcision neutral thing we call the church. And it's also putting it out into the future. Let me, let me just read it real quickly again. For if Joshua had given them rest and God, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Now verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience, which in the context is unbelief. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Again, the, the whole notion here is that we are, again, in God's rest because we're saved by faith, and you know, not of works, there's no merit or anything like that. But even, even though that's true, we're still looking forward to sort of the ultimate rest, you know, the, the, the time that, you know, we'll be with the Lord and, and all this sort of thing. And the book of Hebrews, you know, it, it does this a lot. It, it, it compares the new, the new context, again, the circumcision neutral thing we call the church, to the Old Testament, the one you know, singular national ethnic Israel people of God, and says that, that what's, what's here now is superior to that because Jesus is superior. But yet, Again, this is your already status, but there's a not yet status as well. There's something coming down the road, sort of an ultimate consummation of this relationship you now have uh, with God through Christ. And and the Sabbath here apparently from Hebrews 4 is part of that. So it's not an observance of a week-to-week day. It's a resting in salvation by grace through faith and looking forward to the ultimate rest you know, when we're, when we're on the, the, the new heaven and the new earth, the global Eden. And that's what, you know, that, that's what we want to attain to. And, and the whole idea of, of, of attaining, again, refers to holding on to your faith and not slipping it away uh, due to unbelief, like the Israelites did. The examples he actually gives in that chapter and in chapter 6 and a few other chapters of Hebrews. So I think this is why you have this ambiguity in the New Testament about should we observe the Sabbath. Again, it, it, it's sort of a 
a liberty issue, a conscience issue. And it is that because of the gospel creating a new people of God that's circumcision neutral, and also because the rest of God is something now eschatological. You know, that that, that, that you're, you're resting in your relationship with God now, and in the future, we will get this rest. We will be where God is in, again, the ultimate sense, in a restored Eden.